is a comfort to my soul. Your word is the truth that sets me free. Well, hi there, and welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk in Search of Christianity. As we continue in our study of the letter of James, uh, and this, I believe, is our fifth or sixth week in the letter of James. Yes, that's correct. Uh, I believe so. I I do want to suggest to you that before we start that you do have a Bible handy and maybe a pad for taking some notes. So if you have any questions, if you have any comments, you can jot down, make your little notes. It's a good idea because what you want to do is you you don't want to just hear this. You want to hear from God. You want to meditate on this, that it becomes part of you. Okay? You, You need to do more than just hear it one time. And you need to hear it from God. All right? So you can have a conversation with him about this when it's all said and done. Hallelujah. All right. That, you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You got to hear from God to get that faith. That's right. And the other thing is, and I've said this so many times, don't trust me. Don't trust me. Test me. Be like the Bereans. Test what you hear against the scriptures and make sure that it is indeed so. All right. Because there's a lot of false prophets out there. And that's one of the things we're warned about in these perilous last days, to test the spirits for many false prophets are abroad. That's right. Okay. So as I said, we're going to pick up, we're, we're going to pick up in chapter 2, verse 1. We're going to start right there. Okay. And we're going to do that as soon as my dear sweet patootie Alice here asks for God's blessing on our time together. Always. Father, we just bless you, we praise you, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity that you give us every moment Amen. to be in your word, to hear your word, and to do your word. And Lord, we ask that you would speak the words that you want Alan to have sent out to the to the world. As you said, we are to go out to the world and make disciples. So we ask you, Lord, that your word would touch hearts and change lives. Amen. Amen. Amen and amen. All right, as I said, we're going to start in uh, chapter 2, verse 1 of the letter of James, okay? Okay. Okay. My brethren, by the way, I'm (laughs) I'm reading from the New American Standard, and typically I use the New American Standard, the, the King James, and the English Standard Version, okay? If you're using uh, a more modern translation, make sure that it's true, okay? That's up to you to test that. Mm-hmm. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. You know, the King James says being a respecter of persons or not to be a respecter of persons. Peter said that. Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons in Acts 10, 34. That's in the King James. For there's no respect of persons with God. Paul wrote that in Romans chapter 2, verse 11. And Paul also wrote to the Corinthians, and he said, for the love of God controls us. And then he goes on to say, therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him in that way no longer. That's uh, 2 Corinthians, I read verses 5, part of 14, and then all of 16. It doesn't matter. You know, I don't know why we, we bow before people that we think are so important. When the fact of the matter is, all of us, all of us are the same in Christ Jesus. Oh, God may have different purposes, different ministry, and but the simple fact is, he paid the same price for me as he did for you, Amen. regardless whether you're a king or a pauper. Amen. That's right. So I, I we, we tend to be impressed by people. I'm going to say we, we tend to be impressed by people that have political power or have riches. And as you always said, that if once you meet Jesus Christ, but who else could impress you? Who else can impress you? No man can impress you. That's right. I, I, I had, we have been in doing this ministry for four and a half decades. And we've traveled in many, many, many parts of the world. 
And I've had the opportunity to preach to some of the lowest street people. And I have preached to prime ministers and uh, high muckety-muck politicians over the years. Yes. Why would I be more impressed by one than the other when I spend each day, every day, hanging out with the King of Kings? Hallelujah. Yes. Why do, why do you think that a mayor or a governor is going to impress me when my life is spent continually with the King of Kings? That has to get to be the reality of our life, not just a statement, but it has to be the reality of our life so that we have the same mind as Christ. The same mind as Paul who said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Don't hold your faith in our glorious, don't, you know what I'm saying? Don't think more highly of those people, but first and foremost, don't think more highly of yourself than you are. Right, right, right. Okay? And don't think because of what God has done for you that that's your personal favoritism. Like, oh boy, aren't I special? Well, you know what? He loves you. He loves you. Be it's almost no, it's almost incomprehensible in this world to understand how deep the love of God is for us. I don't think we can understand it. No, while it, we're still here. It, you know, the word says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how we know. That's this is love. But I don't think we have the capacity to truly understand just how much He loves us. Mm. I think that, you know, it's uh, if we did, if we could see that the full love of God in our lives and understand it, we'd probably blow up. Boom, that would be the end of that. It's, it, it's more than we could bear. Okay. But just think about that. Give honor to whom honor is due. But don't get over impressed by somebody because of the position that they're in. Right. Okay? Because Christ paid the same price for that person that he paid for that lowliest bum in the street who has accepted him as his Lord and Savior. Amen. Yes. He loves us. Amen. So, if you start treating all people like that, or in particular, let's talk about the household of God. Mm -hmm. If you're treat, treating brothers and sisters, regardless of how impressive they are, regardless of how much money they have, regardless of what position they hold, if you start treating them with a, as, with a love of God, you know what? You will treat them differently than you are now, I imagine, right? And, and you're going to see as we go into this, that if there's any bias in the way that James is saying we should look at people, his bias is in the opposite direction of what we typically think, right? All right? Because that's the world's way. Absolutely. So think about the fact that if you start treating all believers, particularly all believers that way, you're going to hear at the end of the day, God say to you, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to me, to the one of these brothers of mine, even to the least of them, you did it to me. And you'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. <clears throat> and those are the words that you want to hear, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. So let's just go on and look at this. And I think, you know, it's going to become more and more clear. In verses 2, I'm going to read verses 2, 3, and 4. It says, For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, You sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, You stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives like i said if indeed there's a bias at all it's a bias against the rich here in this letter and you'll, you'll see that right so and tell me you you can't tell me that you've not experienced or seen if you belong to a congregation of any size that the natural tendency is if somebody comes in as James says, in fine clothes, if somebody comes in who's very well-to-do, and do you think they get treated differently than others? Yes. Well, don't let that happen. That's the command of God. Don't let it happen. Because you're judging with evil, evil motives if you do that. God the Father, you know, we've all been purchased with a price, it says. And the price was the same for that person as for that person. The price was the same for me as it is for you. 
So he holds us to be in equal value. And his love for us. And um, what's even more sad, if that's correct, is the fact that if they have somebody come into the, the assembly, so to speak, and they're a guest speaker, but this person is well known because they've been all over, they, that guest speaker expects to be treated differently. Expects to be treated differently. Which is really sad. Well, it, it is. I mean, be, because our love for each other should be the same. Right. All right? It's not, it's not that the, we, we have different ministries, different roles to play in the church. And that's not, there's no doubt about that. That's very clear in Scripture. But the fact of the matter is our value to the body of Christ, our value to Christ, is not based on that. It's based on what God the Father sent Jesus to do for each and every one of those people. The price that he paid was the same for each and every one of us. Absolutely. Jesus Christ died for you. He died for me. He died for each and every one of us. Oh, yeah. That's the price. Right? So let's not make distinctions, okay, and become judges. Let's have the same incredible amount, godly amount of love for everybody who has been saved by the shed blood of Jesus oh, Christ. Don't make those distinctions, right? Because he goes on to say, listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you've dishonored the poor man. If it is not the rich, is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? The, the rich don't have a good reputation with God. No, they don't. Whoa, hello. That's why, you know, there's so much more warning in Scripture as to the danger of riches than there is to the danger of poverty. And yet, you know, it says in Proverbs 30 that he prayed, two things do I ask before I die, right? And he said, give me neither riches nor poverty. Because if you have riches, you'll start to trust in the riches mm -hmm. and you'll deny God. Right. And if you have poverty and you don't know how to deal with that, what you'll do is you'll go out and you'll steal to get what you think you need. Right. Either one of those doesn't work. When you have that knowledge that you are a child of God, loved by God, who promised that he will meet all of your needs through his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, you don't need to do either of those. I have, I have, I don't know, I was going to say, I've been blessed. I, I, it's just been my life that I have had the opportunity to know, and to know intimately many, many very, very wealthy people prior to being saved and after being saved. I grew up in Manhattan on Park Avenue as a kid. My first experience was living on 10 Park Avenue in New York. My, my dad managed the hotel. It was filled with people who were the best known. I mean, they were, they were stars, movie stars, television stars. They were very, very wealthy people. So it was a blessing to me because I wasn't particularly impressed. I'm a kid. Yeah. What do I know? I mean, you know. You're just a big person. That, that, yeah, that, that person is just a big person. It's just a grown up. Okay. <laughs> didn't make any difference to me. But having known so many wealthy people, I have noticed the tendency to think, first of all, they have their riches because they deserve them. Mm. Or they have those, those riches and then don't act as if God had entrusted them and given them a ministry of that money to use for his purpose, all right? It's a fact. Go look at it. Go study it. Go talk to the Lord about it and see what he says. They take all the credit for it. Absolutely. I mean, because it's, that's a, it's an easy thing to do. Sure. Because it's the culture of our world. That, you know, if you have wealth, it's because you deserve it and you earned it. and it's all. No. Whatever you have, you've got because God gave it to you for his purpose. Right. For his pleasure. For his purpose. You know, why do you think it is? I think the most significant teaching in all of Scripture to the believers is the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, oh, 6, absolutely. and 7. Yes. I mean, yes. this was Jesus Christ early in his ministry, taking his new disciples, naming the apostles, and training them in righteousness before he sent them out. Because they didn't know what to do when they went out. Why do you think he had to say to them, you've heard it said, but I say to you. You've heard it said, but I... They didn't know how to pray. They didn't know how to give. They didn't know how to do anything. 
This is why Jesus called them and started to train them in righteousness. Go read 2 Timothy 3.16 and see if that's not what the Word of God is there for. He was renewing their minds. Absolutely, renewing their minds. So, but how did that start? The very first thing that Jesus says to them in that is, blessed are the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Why are they more blessed? No, they're not more blessed. We're all supposed to be poor in spirit. And that will happen when you come to realize that the earth is the Lord's and the, all the fullness thereof. That's what it says in Psalm 24, right? It all belongs to God. It all belongs to him. So you don't own any of it. God put Adam in the garden. He didn't give him, he didn't sign a lease or a deed and give him possession. He didn't give him ownership of the garden. Not at all. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God owned the garden. God owns everything on this earth. All the cattle on a thousand hills. God owns it all. But he gave man stewardship over it. And he gave God, man, God gave man possession of it to use, but to use for God's purpose. Mm -hmm. So, we have that's got to be a foundational truth in our lives because if you don't understand that then no matter what you think you have no matter what's in your bank account little or more it all belongs to god it's his and he has entrusted you with whatever you have and trusted you he has given you stewardship and you are responsible for that that's right so it's a constant reminder that we have to give ourselves because, yes, it's, it, he has given I it to you. nothing. Nothing belongs to me. And by the way, when you start to actually believe that and live that, yeah. you will find that it is so an incredible, it's an incredible blessing. Oh, yeah. There's, a, there's quite a burden to ownership. Yes, it is. And God doesn't want you to be burdened with that. He wants you to be able to use the things that you need, the things that he has need of you having. He wants you to be able to use those things without that burden of ownership. And he said, take... Um, Put it, take my yoke, it is easy. It's easy, yes, my absolutely. My burden is light. Absolutely, okay. So, because when they do that, when when people say, you know, I got this because I deserve it, I earned it, or it, you know, it, well, look at verse seven. Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which they've been called? Oh, yes. Because you're taking away God's glory. And God, believe me, you don't want to do that. So in verse 8, he goes on to say, If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing well. James, later, he talks about the law of liberty. We talked about it in, in the last chapter, right? Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Romans 13, 10. Love, it's all about love, okay? I mean, Christianity is about, it's, a, it's about love. It's not about buildings. It's not about steeples. It's not about padded pews. It's not about pipe organs or choirs. Christianity is about a love, a love affair with Jesus Christ. Amen. It's yes. about a loving relationship with God the Father. That's what Christianity is about. Because remember, it, it says in Galatians, the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Who's your neighbor? <laughs> Wherever you are, turn and look. If you see other people, you're looking at neighbors. Now, this, this, I want to make a distinction here because there is first and foremost for us, there is the family of God. How do you get to be a family of God? By doing the will of the Father. If you don't believe me, go look it up. That's how you get to be part of the family of God. That's right. But everybody's your neighbor. The unsaved, those are your neighbors. Mm -hmm. You love them as you love yourself. If you want to understand that, think about the, this, the account, and the, or it's a, it is a parable, but the account of the Good Samaritan, yes. Yes. where you know this man is beat up and robbed and left to die on the street. And one one Jew walks by. Actually, it says he, he's on the other side of the street. He must have crossed the street to not encounter it. And then then comes a, you know a, a, a priest, a Levite, and he does the same thing. He's on the other side of the street, doesn't want to. But a Samaritan comes along and loves that man who's been beat up, takes care of him, takes him, and and, and the Lord asks this as he's talking to this person, this this theologian, by the way. 
and says, okay, so who's the one that did right? He said, the one that took care of me. He said, you answered rightly. So love your neighbor as yourself. We're to love our enemies. You know, it's not just a matter of, you can't pick and choose who you love. Let me tell you that. You cannot pick and choose who you love. If Jesus Christ did that, now this is the example. I mean, this is, how do we know what love is? He died for us while we were yet sinners. Think of Jesus Christ on that cross. When he said, Father, forgive them, to whom was he talking about? He was talking about the Roman soldier that drove the spikes through his hands. He was talking about the, so the Roman soldier who mocked him and put a crown of thorns on his head. He was talking about the worst people, the people that hated him. And by the way, at that point, you hated him. That's right. You hated him. And yet, he loved you. He loved you so much that that's why he was on that cross, to take away the stain of your sin. That's the heart that we're supposed to have. You know, what, what's a Christian? A Christian is a person whose heart is filled with the love of God. And how, you, by the way, you can't even take credit for that because it says in Romans 5, 5, that God has poured his love into your heart through his Holy Spirit. <clears throat> we need to get with this. These are indeed the perilous last days. And I'm going to tell you something. The world out there is becoming less and less lovable in the natural. Yes. People are becoming more and more hateful by the moment. So it takes the power of the Holy Spirit in your life to be able to love those people. But indeed, God has commanded you to love those people. He'll deal with them. It's not your job. And don't base it on feelings. I mean, that's, I think that's what blocks a lot of people from doing things. Absolutely. We're not to be, we're not to be driven or, you know, by feelings. Right. We have to, when you do it, God does something. He does something amazing. Yes, he does something amazing. When we obey him, he does something amazing with us in our hearts. I'm going to tell you something. Joy comes from love. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, look at the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The first one is love. Yes. The next one is joy. joy. That's right. You want to know why? Because joy comes from love. That's right. Love in your heart will make you have joy in your life. And when you have that love, what comes next? Joy and peace. Peace. You'll have peace. You won't be troubled by all of those evil people out there. That's right. Because they have no power over you. Oh, yeah, they could kill the body. Hello? I'm using this. this look at this body. It's, it's getting killed all by itself. I mean, it's, it's wearing away. It's wearing away. But even though... This, e this old body is wearing away. I am destined for a new one. Hallelujah. Because while the outer man is perishing, the inner man is being renewed day by day. Praise God. So, okay. Love. Don't, don't judge people by the way they look, all right? Unless you can see their heart. And by the way, you can't, you, see, you can say, well, I can't see their heart. You can hear their heart. You can hear their heart. You know why? Because it says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Let me sit around and talk with you for a while, and I'll, I'll hear your heart. I'll know, what, I'll know what's exactly in your heart by the way you talk. Okay. The world of love is, is not about licentiousness, all right? It's about, it's about loving. First of all, your love has to start with the household of God. Right? So I'm going to shift down to verse 12. It says, so speak and act as those who are being judged by the law of liberty. The law of liberty. Jesus Christ said he, said, he came to set the captives free. Whom, whom, this, whom Jesus set free, we're free indeed. All right? The spirit of God is a spirit of freedom. No matter what's going on, I mean, right now, in many places in the world, certainly right here where we are in Central Florida, we're in a lockdown. We don't have the quote-unquote freedom to go out and do what we want, go where we want. Yeah, look. We're, we're, we're set free <laughs> in the Lord. Set free to worship, by the way. That's right. 
So we, we just need to get that part. We need to get that understanding, all right? Because if you're fulfilling the royal law of love, according to the scripture, which says you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. Wait a minute, that's verse 8. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Talking about the law of liberty, okay? So there's a tightrope. I'm going to tell you this, okay? The way we travel is narrow indeed, okay? The way that leads to destruction is broad and easy. The way we're walking is narrow. How narrow? It's like a tightrope. And the devil wants to push you off that, that narrow way. He doesn't care whether you go off to, this, to the right or to the left as long as you go off it. You've got to walk that straight and narrow, okay? Mm -hmm. And these are the days, because it says in Jude 14, 4, for certain persons have crept in unnoticed. He's talking about crept into the fellowship. Those who were long before beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. It's Jude 1, 4, like I said. Licentiousness, that's, that's something that troubled the early church because it was like because of the amazing grace of God and amazing it is, you think you have permission to do wrong because he's going to forgive you. You know he's going to forgive you. Do you? I mean, at some point in time, your heart will become hardened. If you believe that you can go out and do whatever you want and then just go in, and I got to tell you, I grew up in a tradition of the church where you, you could basically do anything you want. Then on Saturday, you go to the confessional and it's all white clean. And it makes it easy to sin during the week. Right. All right? You get to the point where you don't really care. You don't even ask for forgiveness. Don't ever let it be easy for you to sin. Right. I mean, you know it offends God. If you have the mind of Christ, I pray to God that every time you do something wrong, it offends you. Yes. Because that's the way it should be. We should be offended by the things that offend God we, because we do have the mind of Christ. Okay? So because license is a formal permission from a government or other constituted authority to do something as to like carry on a business or a professional. Mm -hmm. Grace does not bestow license yes. we are slaves of righteousness is what it says paul wrote in romans six eighteen. you're either slave of righteousness or you're a slave of sin so we are bound to do what is right that doesn't mean that we're never going to trip or never do it but thank god if we're faithful to confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive them but please be on guard put a guard on yourself that sin starts to bother you, sin in your life bothers you at least as much as it bothers God. And the Holy Spirit will, is there to guide and protect us. Because he's there to, send, to lead us into all truth. Exactly. So if we're going off, he's going to let us know. Yeah, but because We have to be aware and take heed. Because if you love the Lord, yes. and, and I, I pray that you do, if you do something wrong, one of the things that we have a tendency to do is to justify it. Yes, make excuses. Make excuses. And excuses are the fiery arrows that are shot from the pits of hell to kill repentance. There we go. So don't justify, don't excuse sin in your life. Right. Face it and deal with it. And the only way you can deal with it is by seeking the face of God for forgiveness. All right? Mm -hmm. All right, so, my goodness gracious, we're out of time already. So I'm going to end on by reading verse 9. But if you show partiality or respect to persons, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Do not think more highly of yourself than you should, and do not think more lowly of others than you should. Look at people and ask God to show you the way he sees them. I'm talking about the saints of God, even the sinners. That's right. Remember, it was for those sinners that he died on that cross. I know I was one of them. Father, I just pray that you would teach us, that you would train us up, that you would show us, Lord God, how we can live in the fullness of that life that you provided for us. For whom the Spirit, the Son set free is free indeed. And it was for freedom that you sent the Holy Spirit into our lives. 
Lord, help us to learn how to love others the way you love others. Lord, help us to think not more highly of ourselves than we should, but Lord, to desire to become just like your son, Christ Jesus, because indeed that is your great promise in our lives that whom you foreknew, you predestined to be conformed into the image of your son, Christ Jesus. Father, I just want to close this by praying, make us more like Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, till next time, God bless you and goodbye.